Hello friends, I'm Mike, the hi-fi fanatic behind Audio Architects. For those who are already subscribed, it's good to see you back for more. If you're a first timer and you're into speakers, amplifiers, CD players, subwoofers, headphones, music, basically all things audio, you're in the right place. It would be best if you stuck around for a bit because I am going to discuss how the recording industry has single-handedly ruined the quality of music for many people. They refer to it as the loudness war or the loudness race. Whatever designation you place on it, it won't excuse that the final phase of music production process was flawed for many years during mixing and mastering. Sound engineers often applied a practice called dynamic compression. When mastering a track in such excess, it clipped the music, causing unnecessary noise, reducing audio fidelity, crushing dynamic range, and just gravely affecting the listener's experience, not to mention changing the original intentions of the artist entirely. You see, there are quiet and loud parts to musical tracks. When you look at the waveform of a standard recording on Audacity, for example, you'll see a bit of space between the amplitude peaks, and that space in between is called dynamic range. Dynamic range is your friend. You want a nice amount of it in your music. It creates a clear and natural sound and prevents fatigue from listening for extended periods of time. So when you apply dynamic compression, what this process does is it takes the quiet parts and cranks them up right there with the loud parts to make the entire song or album a loud and noisy mess. The soft elements to me are essential because that's when we can hear and catch the small nuances of a song, like the separation of instruments. Without this, yeah, it still sounds like music. However, there isn't a distinct character to the music. Here's a picture of what a compressed song looks like. Crazy, right? The worst part is that when it's done, it's done. You can't take it back. You can't take back dynamic compression, which is sad because many albums I really liked, I've discovered use this process. I can only imagine how amazing said albums could have been had they not been bastardized to begin with. But there is one band that gets the Golden Poop Award, and that's Metallica for putting out the album Death Magnetic. It's considered the loudest album ever produced. I could care less for Metallica or what they do. I firmly believe they peaked with the Black Album, maybe S&M with the release of No Leaf Clover. Regardless, many of their fans were completely upset because it just didn't sound good at all. There will always be dynamic compression in albums and songs, mainly to add impact during certain parts of, the, of a piece where, you know, a little more oomph is needed, which is fine. This is how the artist wanted it. However, when you overcompress to the point where the music is just a consistently muddled mess, then that's where the issues arise. The other day, my friend and I listened to the Greatest Showman soundtrack right after listening to Eugene Ruffalo's Poor Lonesome Me track. Wow. We both felt the dynamic range and soundstage took a tremendous hit when playing the song The Greatest Show. So compression to one degree or another is still an issue today. Most people who grew up in the mid to late 90s and were active music listeners in the 2000s are in a way victims of the loudness war because most popular music was you know, using these practices much more frequently during this era to make music louder. Why did they do this? You might wonder. We all wonder. Making music releases louder began to appeal to people within the industry partly because of how noticeably louder some releases had become and partly because the industry believed that customers preferred louder sounding CDs. They wanted to stand out. Even though now looking back, it's a regrettable practice that made the recordings fatiguing and in some instances, not even pleasant to listen to. They mistakenly assumed for the consumer, but we, the consumer, took the hit and had to listen to terribly mastered albums for many, many years. It's inconceivable that the audio format that offered the most significant dynamic range potential ever made, ever, is now used regularly to store music intentionally processed with the least possible dynamic range in the history of recorded music. Unbelievable. You're probably asking yourself, why do I care about this? Well, 
If you're listening to music through an entry-level system or some cheap headphones, and this is how you'll always listen to music, which is nothing bad, you shouldn't care. But if you are getting serious about audio and investing money into the hobby, you should be aware of this. There are still hundreds, if not thousands of albums, remasters, and recordings that sound terrible because of dynamic compression. For the folks that live by high resolution and high bitrate music, a topic we will save for another video, how about we look at better mastering first? If the audio engineer mixes and masters a track properly, I firmly believe you can play it comfortably at CD quality and fall in love with the results. As I said, we will get into bit rates and sample rates in a future video. So for me, the final question would be, how will the music industry and recording engineers create and shape music from here on out? Well, in 2015, a prominent American mastering engineer, Bob Katz, said the loudness wars were over. Pretty bold to speak for the entire industry. A step towards normalcy is that streaming services have been proactive by putting processes in place to attempt to normalize the music we consume via streaming. I guess the end goal is for each track to be balanced automatically to have the same overall loudness as every other track, causing consistency. Because of this normalization, overcompressed material sounds flat, weak, and uninteresting compared with more naturally dynamic material. Hopefully this will motivate the audio engineers to end overcompression and instead encourage music creators to mix and master their music to retain musical dynamics and transients. If this proves to be the case, the loudness wars may indeed be over. However, for the hard-headed CD nuts like me, I want to know in my heart that the CDs to come will be dynamic and full of detail. The only way to know for sure is to trust the artists to push hard for their music to become pieces of art again rather than short-term cash grabs. At the end of the day, nobody won, and a lot of good music was ruined. I can only hope that bands from the late 90s, 2000s, and 2010s do a series of re-releases with the branding that they were correctly mastered in the coming years. That's if any of these bands, A, have access to their original master recordings before the compression, and B, feel like giving something back to the fans. This would be yet another excellent feature for the future of compact discs. Exclusive remasters. Correctly remastered. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me. I hope this gave you some clarity on the subject and hopefully opened your eyes and ears to how the music industry has provided you with substandard garbage products for over 20 years. If you're already subscribed, thank you. I have an online shop I would love for you to visit. It has a ton of audio related t-shirts, hoodies, and merchandise. And I think it's pretty cool. The proceeds from the store help support the channel, of course. Uh, if you're new to the channel and you like it so far, I encourage you to check out some of my other content. And if you like that, then I would want you to go a step further and possibly subscribe to the channel, like some videos, and uh, come back for more. So thank you all for joining me. I hope to see you all again soon and have a great week.